You know, fear is one of the things that's in the atmosphere this time of year, isn't it? And in some ways, we like it. And I I like it. I like to be scared. In fact, some members last night went on a haunted tour of Nashville. Because we kind of like to be scared, don't we? I mean, if we didn't, would we have all these scary movies? Would we enjoy sitting around the campfire telling ghost stories? We wouldn't, would we? But there's something about it that stimulates us, that scares us, and we like it. Would we have roller coasters? Now, there's something about fear that we like, but there is also something about fear that we dislike, isn't it? And of course, if we live in fear, in this prolonged state of fear, it's really antithetical to Christ and to Christianity. It's not Christian living to live in fear. Now, sometimes we might not get the idea from church that really that's what we're supposed to be doing. Sometimes we associate going to church with what? Being in fear. But actually, the Christian life is to be a life where there is no fear. I was looking at a a poll that they do every year. Every year they study what Americans fear the most. And I have the top ten things that Americans fear. And I'm going to tell you these things without any kind of agenda. Politically, this is what happens every year. Chapman University, their sociology department... They study fear. They study what Americans fear. And so I want to give you the top ten things that Americans fear. Number ten, the Affordable Care Act. Now, I don't know what's so scary about it, but that's a fear. Number ten. Number nine, people I love becoming ill. Now, that seems to be a legitimate fear, doesn't it? That's something all of us can relate to. Number eight, identity theft. Certainly we hear a lot of that in the news, don't we? About people's identity, their economic identity, their credit cards, their social security cards, their identity within economic things can be stolen. In fact, there's people who go out and and look through trash cans and define pertinent information about who you are, and they will take that, set up credit cards, get into your bank account, destroy your credit, identity theft. Number seven, economic collapse. Certainly we can all remember eight or nine years ago when the economy went into the tank. It sunk, didn't it? And the recession, and they're still trying to dig their way out. Number six, people I love dying. Certainly we can fear that. Number five, government restrictions on guns. Maybe that's something you fear. Number four, becoming a victim of terror. Certainly we look in the news and we see all these terrible things that happen. We see people being gunned down. Violently in public places. That can happen to us. We've seen it in churches, haven't we? People becoming victims of terror. This is something we fear. Three, not having enough money. Running out of money. Not being able to find work. Number two, terrorist attacks, which kind of relates to the previous one, number four. And lastly, number one, corruption of government officials is the number one fear in America. Now, I don't know if we need to fear that because I think it's already happened. (laughs) But that is what this year's list of top ten things are. And what fear does to us, it does a lot of things. It's very powerful, isn't it? And of course, fear as an instinct can save you. It can help you. It can help you if you fight some kind of an adversary or it can help you when you run. Because all of a sudden you have this adrenaline, you have this energy, you can run and and get away. But if we live in fear, that's not Christian living, is it? It's not. 
Fear is powerful. It paralyzes us. It causes us to be inactive sometimes. I remember one time I saw this car. I was in a parking lot. And this car all of a sudden just started driving erratically in the parking lot. And I swear to you, I I saw it and I heard it and I just froze. And for some reason I couldn't move. It totally surprised me. It totally scared me. Fear, it paralyzed me. And also what fear can do is cause you to provoke, cause you to do something, cause you to strike out, to hurt somebody. You get scared, and what do you do? Well, you fight. But living in fear is not the Christian life. And in fact, Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, the verse that we read, for we have not, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he says, of power, of love, and of sound mind. Well, Paul doesn't know anything about fear, does he? He doesn't know the fear I'm facing. He doesn't know the hostile environment that I live in. Really? The Apostle Paul knew fear, didn't he? If anyone knew what a perilous world that we live in, it was the Apostle Paul. And here he's talking to Timothy, and he's telling Timothy that I'm going to be dying soon. In fact, he says, I'm being poured out. And I have fought the good fight. I have finished the faith. I have kept the faith. And and you know what, Timothy? I'm going to be dying soon for the cause of Christ. And now I'm giving you the responsibility of the churches. Think about how daunting of a responsibility. Here you have the Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary on earth, telling you he's fixing to die. And now it's going to be your responsibility. Now let me tell you, I sweated a lot of bullets when I started preaching here. But to inherit the responsibility of the Apostle Paul, think about that. And and Paul tells Timothy, we have not received a spirit of fear. Don't be afraid, but you have received a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind. That's how you live. Is that how Paul lived? He said, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. That's 195 lashes against his back. Thrice was I stoned. Thrice was I shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Did Paul know terror? Did Paul know persecution? He said, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. Over and over again in 2 Corinthians 11, he says the word peril. And now, Timothy, it's yours. And he says, you haven't received the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. We all know fear, don't we? I can tell you, four years ago, when we were giving birth to our first child, when I got up to the desk, the woman at the desk said, this is your first one, right? (laughs) She knew there was fear in my eyes. We all know fear, don't we? I was anxious. I was nervous. I was scared. One time, the Russian premier, Nikita Khrushchev, was speaking. And he had some associations in the past with Joseph Stalin. But he was against Joseph Stalin. He was talking about all the atrocities and speaking against the past policies of Stalin. And someone in the audience cried out, well, why didn't you stop him? And Khrushchev roared back and said, who said that? And it was quiet. It was silent. And he said, now you know. Fear. Fear paralyzes us, don't it? It causes us not to say things. It causes us not to do things. It takes over our life. It's an impulse. 
But God has not given us that spirit. If you are scared, if you are fearful, that is not from God. Because that's not the spirit He gives. He gives one a power of love and of sound mind. God is a giver, isn't He? He gives to us everything that is good and perfect in your life. The good things in your life are from God. It says in James that God tempts no man. No man can say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God does not tempt anyone. There is no darkness in Him. There is none of that in Him. The spirit of fear is not from God. God doesn't lie. There is no untruthfulness to Him. He tells the truth. In fact, He can swear by none other than Himself because of His immutable truthfulness. God doesn't lie. And God doesn't want anyone here to perish or to be lost. But He doesn't give us fear. There is a healthy fear. There is that fear that is reverence for God. When, when in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let us fear God and keep His commandments. That is reverencing God for who He is. Respecting Him. That the beginning of wisdom is fearing God. But the Spirit of God is not one of anxiety or fear. You know, he talks about the Spirit in 2 Timothy 1.7. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit we're given to in conversion. We're born of the water and of the Spirit. That the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of God. That we're born again in Spirit. That there's a new Spirit within us. And it's His Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is not of fear. So what does it look like? Number one, Paul says it is the spirit of power. The opposite of fear is power, isn't it? With God, all things are possible. It is a world of possibility, not of fear. It is a world with His presence. Think about the safest place that you know of. There's no safer place than with God. His presence. He says in Isaiah 41.13, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. That's how close and intimate God wants to be in your life. That He wants to hold your hand and be present with you. Remember the psalmist says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He's given us a spirit of power. And the amazing thing too is is that God changes things. God changes people, doesn't He? There's some who will tell you God can't change people. Or that people don't change. But God does. God performs miracles. He is a supernatural God and can change things. He is a God of power and of might. He empowers us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And think about that gift of prayer that we don't use enough. Sometimes we think, well, what about those times where God didn't change it? Did He hear me? C.S. Lewis once said, there is no question whether an event has happened because of your prayer. When the event you prayed for occurs, your prayers always contributed to it. When the opposite event occurs, your prayers have never been ignored. It has been considered and refused for your ultimate good and the good of the whole universe. You see, sometimes God says no because it's not in your best interest. And not only is it not in your best interest, it's not in the world's best interest. It may not be in your wife's best interest. There's a bigger picture to your prayer than just you. And that is for your own well-being and for the world's well-being. He's given us a spirit of power. He's given us a spirit of love. Think about that. A spirit of love. 
What we feel and why we do things is important too. It's not just about what we do on the outside, it's about what we do on the inside. And really that's what love's all about, isn't it? And that's what even Paul himself wrestled with in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but if I have not love, I have become a sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith that I could remove mountains, but if I have not love, it means nothing. And even if I give and bestow my goods to the poor and I give my body to be burned, but if I have not love, it profits nothing. Not only is it about what you do, it's about why you do it. And a spirit of love is what God has given us. Why do you do what you do? T.S. Eliot once said, The last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. And Paul said, You can give your body to be burned. You can give all your things to the poor. But if you're not rooted in love, it doesn't matter. Also, the Apostle John in 1 John 4 tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. When you love somebody, when you love God, it takes away that fear. And it says that when we come to the the day of judgment, we can come to Christ boldly, not in fear, but in love. And lastly, number three, he says, he doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of sound mind, of discipline, of intentionality. What is fear? Fear is impulsive. That as soon as you feel it, it takes over your life. All of a sudden, you can't control it anymore. That is the direct opposite of how God wants you to live. He doesn't want you to live impulsively. He wants you to live intentionally, disciplined, a disciple of Christ. Think about the life of Jesus. Was there anything impulsive about Jesus? Now think long and hard on that. Think about it. Was there anything impulsive about Jesus? The answer is no. In fact, every compartment, every facet of His life was intentional. Down from when He was born to when He died, everything was planned. It was intended. No accidents happened in Jesus' life. Not really. It was intended. It was by the eternal counsels of God's will. He was determined by the foreknowledge of God to be on this earth and to do what He did. His life was in complete intentional. Now, how does our lives look in comparison to that? I can tell you, I'm impulsive. I can tell you, I I fly sometimes by the seat of my pants. But Jesus calls us to live within His eternal will. That instead of living impulsively for the moment, all of a sudden now I'm living in eternity with Him. We can obey God impulsively, can't we? Well, you know what? I think I will obey God. And I'm going to just do do what He says. But if you're doing it impulsively, are you truly doing it for the right reasons? You know, impulse got Peter to walk on water. All right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to walk on water. Impulse got him out there. We say, what great faith he had. And yes, he had faith to be able to jump out there on the water. But it was an act of impulse, wasn't it? We found out it was impulse because what happened to him? He sank. In fact, we know it's impulse because when he was on land, Peter and Jesus, and Jesus was led away to the Sanhedrin, where do you find Peter? It says walking at a distance. Following at a distance. All of a sudden, the same guy who was walking on water, impulsively, was following Jesus from way back. Yes, impulse can get you to obeying, but it's not the richness and the trueness of intentionally 
following Jesus no matter where it leads. He's given us a spirit of sound mind, of discipline, of intentionality, living within His eternal will. So what does that mean for us today? It means to obey Christ. And to not live our lives in the fear of man, in the fear of ourselves, in the fear of a stranger, but to trust in God for who He is, that He is sovereign God of the universe. And He understands us and He has us within His hand and within His control and to trust in that. If we can't trust God for the temporal things, why should, he, why should we trust Him for the eternal? If you can't trust God in life, then how can you trust Him with eternity? Because eternity is deeper and farther out, isn't it? And if I can't trust God with today, I can't trust Him in eternity. Someone once said that in the Bible it says over 365 times, do not fear, do not be afraid. And that's enough time for every day of the week of the year. 365 times. One last thought I want to leave with you is a quote from Plato himself. He says, and it's about fear, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. I can forgive my child when she needs the night light on, but it's harder to forgive men when they're actually afraid of goodness and of the Gospel, and of the light. Jesus is that light. If you take Jesus out of the world, there is no light. There is no goodness. There is no grace. There is no love. There is no mercy. But the sad thing is, is that there are men and women who are afraid of that light. Because they've never known that light. Are you afraid of that light? Are you afraid? The Bible says that we don't have to live in fear. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, that no matter what comes, God has you. God loves you. And there is eternity with Him in heaven. Have you given your life to Christ? The Bible says to believe in Christ, to believe in who He says He was. He is the Son of Man, the Son of God. Repent of those sins that destroy us, that hurt us, that hurt our families, that hurt our community. Confess Jesus to be who He is and to be immersed into His body, the church. Or maybe you're a Christian and you've let fears get inside of you. The Bible says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of one, of power and of love. And of sound mind. If you have any need, won't you come now as together we stand and as we sing?